Dr. Eula Bingham. Now I know why I kept uh, messing up the public address systems. I was coming down with a cold. <clears throat> You'll have to bear with me, and I hope that uh, I don't lapse into a fit of coughing. If I do, you just have to let me recover and keep on going. Kurt Va Vondegut has said that a particularly American form of suicide is holding a steady job. I think that the Congress must have had that in mind when they passed the Occupational Safety and Health Act. I would like to uh, emphasize the first part of the act, which is to assure, so far as possible, every working man and woman in the nation safe and healthful working conditions and to preserve our human resources. I was uh, <clears throat> reading a little uh, blast that was issued by the Chamber of Commerce yesterday saying that we had failed. A little bit later on I'll point out some of the reasons why I think we have failed. I would first like to point out that the obligation for a safe and healthy workplace is placed squarely on the shoulders of the employer, the person who owns the factory and takes home the profits from it. Now in our act, uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration has a number of mandates. One of those is to issue standards. Early on, uh, those of you in the audience who know all about this will forgive me, but this is a conference seminar for the media, and I'm not sure they know about the history of our act. Early on, the, there was a group of standards uh, called the consensus standards, very specific in their nature, developed by industry groups. And we were charged, uh, the agency was charged with uh, getting on with the business of occupational safety and health and to take those standards and literally make them the first legal standards. The agency did that. I guess much to their sorrow. They should have start, begun to go through those standards and take out those um, standards that were really uh, irrelevant that made the agency the laughing stock and the butt of jokes in every newspaper and magazine in this country. We have uh, eliminated going through a rulemaking procedure a number of those standards and we are methodically going through uh, rewriting many of the standards for example the fire protection standard is in its final stages of being revised uh, it looks as if that standard uh, will go from what 400 pages down to something like 30 pages it will go from being a purely specification standard to a performance standard. <clears throat> We're doing the same thing with the electrical code. But I would like to point out one thing. You heard individuals from corporate corporations up here uh, urging that we do turn toward performance standards. And I think um, this make scientific logic. However, we serve more than the Fortune 500. Our standards cover small businesses. Uh, those small business men and women would like for you to tell them how to do it, how to do it. 
what we're trying to do is uh, provide an appendix in those situations uh, to the performance standard uh, as a how-to guide. So what is uh, good for one company isn't necessarily the way to go for another one. If you look at the, um, the act and uh, focusing once again on standards, it says that standards for toxic or harmful f physical agents shall be set, which most adequately assures to the extent feasible, which is a very important word, on the basis of the best available evidence, no employee will suffer material impairment of health or functional capacity even if such employee has regular exposure to the hazard dealt with for the period of his working life. Uh, I would like to emphasize, um, in addition to feasibility, impairment of health or functional capacity. We're not talking just about deaths and whether it's 100,000 or 200,000, I'm not prepared to say. But I can tell you there are many people out there that are being made ill. There are people whose functional capacity uh, is uh, being diminished. Functional capacity, if you're a physiologist sitting out there, uh, <clears throat> you know would refer to maintaining adequate pulmonary function to lead an active and full life to uh, be able to filter urine so that you don't have to have dialysis, to be able to produce, whether a man or a woman, a uh, offspring. It is only in the past three years that we have begun really to deal with the health standards. Um, there was very little activity before that. And while uh, the, long, the course is long and slow and tedious, uh, we have in the last two and a half years put out uh, more standard, more health standards than had ever been issued by the agency previously. I'd like to point out that our concern with health standards uh, does not preclude a great deal of concern with safety standards. Uh, we still don't have the, uh, an appropriate standard for confined spaces. That is, when workers go down into tanks with uh, toxic fumes, we do not have appropriate standards. We do not have adequate standards to cover the uh, refining uh, industry for uh, refinery turnarounds. We are working diligently on those standards. In the area of enforcement, um, and I guess that's what our reputation has been built or gone down the tube on, uh, it's very interesting. Um, we have 1,750 inspectors, 1,000 are safety inspectors, 750 are industrial hygienists. We can visit 2% of the workplaces in this country in a year. We have cross-trained uh, inspectors so that the safety inspectors can recognize some of the health hazards, but we go into very sophisticated uh, workplaces. And uh, <clears throat> I can tell you, having been in the university for a long time, a PhD in industrial hygiene coming out uh, will have a difficult time time being able to be caught up on all the different kinds of processes that we are called upon uh, to look at and make judgments ab about during uh, any month in um, a typical area office. I guess what I'm saying to you is that uh, we're going to be doing spot checks the word enforcement is um, perhaps a euphemism. Uh, we do spot checks. We do, of course, issue citations, and we do uh, provide uh, penalties in some situations, 
but uh, it is hardly uh, an, uh, an enforcement program uh, as uh, some people have made it out to be. There are many things that eat up the time of a compliance officer. Um, <clears throat> it's been interesting for me here uh, to see some of the disbelief uh, on the faces of reporters, media individuals, and uh, some of the individuals who have been here from industries who I think would not believe some of the things except uh, I think they believe the workers who have come to the microphone and who have told about their experiences. <clears throat> well, would you believe me if I would tell you that there are places where there exp are explosions, that there have been explosions in the last six months, and we have gone out to investigate the fatality and have been turned away and asked to go obtain a warrant, and we do that. But um, it seems rather uh, a remarkable uh, event to me, and uh, I'm not sure that the Supreme Court intended that that should be the way that we would deal with the death of individuals in the workplace. I'm convinced that just issuing standards, and I don't discount them, and just making enforcement uh, inspections will ever solve the problem. And I guess after the first six months I was at OSHA, um, <clears throat> I became quite depressed because it was clear that it took something else. I think the Congress also came to this conclusion and they urged upon the agency a consultation program. <clears throat> we have taken that ball and we've run with it. We now have consultation free of charge available in every state in the United States. The states run the consultation. The government pays 90% of it. There are a couple of states around uh, that have chosen not to come into the program. And in those states, we pay the full amount for the consultative program. And we have had it uh, bid on a competitive bid and a contractor runs it. We give first priority to small businesses. Um, it's clear from what Dr. Carr said that DuPont doesn't need our advice. Uh, there, are some other, there are some large corporations though that I could think could use some advice. But certainly the small businessman or woman um, does need help and we're there to provide it. And you know, it's a fine free service. Uh, it's something that every business in this country should take advantage of. When I came to the agency, I looked at the educational program. <clears throat> and I guess early on, uh, somebody decided or they entered into a memorandum of understanding with NIOSH and it was uh, the pie was sort of divided that we would do worker education and NIOSH would do the education of the professionals. Now I suppose uh, we uh, have a little fringe overlap. Uh, I sure wouldn't want to deny Tony the opportunity to educate a few workers. And I hope he wouldn't deny me the opportunity to take on some young physicians uh, as an internship in OSHA because they learn a lot in our place. But by and large, it's divided up that way. We were spending $1 million a year for the education of employers and employees in this country. Can you imagine that? I think it's a national disgrace. We now uh, are spending uh, approximately $8 million. Um, there is uh, an additional amount of a couple million um, in the budget, if uh, we ever get a budget of Congress this fall, that will provide us with more funds. <clears throat> but I think that um, this will provide perhaps the catalyst to make a real difference uh, in the workplaces in this country. 
it is very important that employers, particularly small employers, understand the hazards of the workplace. It is very important that all workers in this country have an understanding of the hazards. <coughs> workers must know the names of the chemicals they're working with. They must know the hazards that result from those chemicals and they must know the precautions that are to be taken. They must know whether they have been exposed to the chemical. They must know when they have developed silicosis as a result to, of exposure to silica. It can no longer be hidden in a um, medical record in a doctor's office. It must be uh, provided to a worker. It is just uh, impossible for us to continue that way. We have to inform workers as to what their rights are, uh, as to what they're working with, and I think this educational program uh, will provide that. The money is going to trade associations because they have a very important role to play. Um, they reach many small employers that would never be reached in any other way. Many small employers um, belong to a um, one trade association. So it's very important that uh, we get this information out. The money goes to labor unions to develop, to develop health and safety programs, uh, educational programs for their uh, members. And I'm very sorry that we don't have here today an example of one of these programs. I have uh, seen um, health and safety material developed by workers um, that um, is the best media I have seen developed by uh, anyone. They are very, someone mar remarked to me a few minutes ago how articulate uh, working men and women are. Um, well, it's their lives, they're, they're, uh, they, they must become articulate. The, um, I guess my conversion as to how, and I've told this story, I, uh, though some of you will forgive me, I guess that I became most impressed by this during the Coke Oven Advisory uh, Committee hearings, uh, the carcinogen hearings I was in, but we never listened to many workers. Um, but uh, workers showed up at the Coke Oven Advisory Committee hearings and they sat in the audience and we would sit around the table and make very weighty pronouncements about how things were in a factory. And of course, we had industry representatives and we had some union representatives, uh, but they were, uh, uh, you know, fairly high up in the union and fairly high up in the company. And uh, one day a uh, comment was made uh, uh, concerning whether or not uh, when there was a spill of coals on the top of the charging oven uh, or on the side after they had um, uh, pushed a charge, uh, whether or not uh, that was ever cleaned up. And um, we went around the table and I asked for information and I said, no, that was never cleaned up. That would be very time consuming and it was just impossible to do that. Uh, well, I could see the workers in the back of the room and the audience whisper to each other and I just knew that there was something going on back there. So this was early in the proceedings. I asked them um, if, they, if anyone in the audience had anything to say and sure enough, an individual put his hand up and uh, he said, we do that every day in our plant in Pennsylvania. And uh, so the next day we had an issue and sure enough, the workers were able to give us the straight answers. I don't think anybody was lying around that table. It's just that they didn't know what was actually happening on the shop floor. And you must listen to workers because they know. Thank you.